All right. Erev Tov to everybody. Everyone settle down now. Um, we're going to go straight to uh, PowerPoint. Actually, not to PowerPoint. We're going to go look at something. We're going to watch a four-minute video, which is going to seem like it has nothing to do with anything. Uh, but before the video, we are actually going to look at one slide. as an introduction to the chapter. There's an introduction to the chapter, and then we're going to do this four-minute video. It's a four-minute, uh, less than that, TED Talk. You'll see why. And then I have to give you another introduction because it's actually a, not a simple chapter, but it's something that's going to be a little bit more understandable than some things you've done recently, but it requires some buildup, so to speak. So first, let's actually take a look at one slide, chapter 21, part one. Whoops. Here we go. Okay. In the last chapter, there was a, there was a, uh, what's it called? A um, parable that was given. What's happening here? Messed up here. Okay. There was a parable given. <clears throat> Which had to do with the, dis the distance, so to speak, between a person's speech and the person himself. What does that mean? The, 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 the whole, the, the point of this mashal, this parable, was the difference between a person's actual words that come out of the mouth and the essence of the person. From one simple sentence that a person can say an endless amount of sentences, relative to the essence, the person's neshama and their machshava, their thought process and everything else, I'll translate in a minute. What does that long sentence mean? It means that there's an extremely long distance, as it were, between the words that come out of our mouth and the initial processing that started with that word. I say a single word. Where does it come from? It comes from in my brain. It comes from my, my thoughts. Thoughts is something that's called mufshat or abstract. And, and what happens is the if you were to compare the power of the brain and the thought process and everything to the little sentence or word you said, it's day and night. It's like a million miles apart. This distance between the words we speak and the the brain power we have and the, and the thought process that we have to come up with that word is, is significant. What it's gigantic. When it comes to the parable, to the one who we are comparing to, meaning God, it's, it's impossible to say, the, the, to make that distinction. One thing we said last week was that when Hashem created the world, he created with 10 utterances and you think, wow, that's such power and everything. And we, and, and the, and the, Admor Azakein, he demonstrated that Hashem was, it was nothing. It was insignificant. Just like our one word that comes out of our mouth is, is really insignificant. So for Hashem also, in addition to that, we also demonstrated, he demonstrated that before God created the world and after God created the world, Hashem is the same, no change. Now in this chapter, he's going to deal with the topic, the Hashem aspect. I mean, a parable you have, what's called the Mashal, the parable, and the Nimshal, the one it was compared to or parabled for, which is Hashem. Okay. In order for us to start to understand what is this concept, quote unquote, of speech of God, and how is it different speech of God versus speech of man? There have to be a certain amount of pieces of information, kind of like background for us to understand. Now, before we do that, I found something kind of cool. I hope you'll find it cool. Um, it says like it's four and a half minutes or something. It's not because there's like a little commercial near the end. The average 20-year-old knows between 27,000 and 52,000 different words. By age 60, that number averages between 35,000 and 56,000. Spoken out loud, most of these words last less than a second. So with every word, the brain has a quick decision to make. 
which of those thousands of options matches the signal. About 98% of the time, the brain chooses the correct word. But how? Speech comprehension is different from reading comprehension, but it's similar to sign language comprehension, though spoken word recognition has been studied more than sign language. The key to our ability to understand speech is the brain's role as a parallel processor, meaning that it can do multiple different things at the same time. Most theories assume that each word we know is represented by a separate processing unit that has just one job, to assess the likelihood of incoming speech matching that particular word. In the context of the brain, the processing unit that represents a word is likely a pattern of firing activity across a group of neurons in the brain's <laughs> cortex. When we hear the beginning of a word, several thousand such units may become active because with just the beginning of a word, there are many possible matches. Then, as the word goes on, more and more units register that some vital piece of information is missing and lose activity. Possibly well before the end of the word, just one firing pattern remains active, corresponding to one word. This is called the recognition point. In the process of honing in on one word, the active units suppress the activity of others, saving vital milliseconds. Most people can comprehend up to about eight syllables per second. Yet the goal is not only to recognize the word, but also to access its stored meaning. The brain accesses many possible meanings at the same time, before the word has been fully identified. We know this from studies which show that even upon hearing a word fragment, like cap, listeners will start to register multiple possible meanings, like captain or capital, before the full word emerges. This suggests that every time we hear a word, there's a brief explosion of meanings in our minds, and by the recognition point, the brain has settled on one interpretation. The recognition process moves more rapidly with a sentence that gives us context than in a random string of words. Context also helps guide us towards the intended meaning of words with multiple interpretations, like bat or crane or, in cases of homophones, like no or no. For multilingual people, the language they are listening to is another cue, used to eliminate potential words that don't match the language context. So what about adding completely new words to this system? Even as adults, we may come across a new word every few days. But if every word is represented as a fine-tuned pattern of activity distributed over many neurons, how do we prevent new words from overwriting old ones? We think that to avoid this problem, new words are initially stored in a part of the brain called the hippocampus, well away from the main store of words in the cortex, so they don't share neurons with other words. Then, over multiple nights of sleep, the new words gradually transfer over and interweave with old ones. Researchers think this gradual acquisition process helps avoid disrupting existing words. So in the daytime, unconscious activity generates explosions of meaning as we chat away. At night, we rest, but our brains are busy integrating new knowledge into the word network. When we wake up, this process ensures that we're ready for the ever-changing world of language. All right, let me end this. And go back to the screen. All right. So, so <clears throat> let me give you a little bit more introduction. The topic here, as I said, is going to be speech and how speech of humans, we already demonstrated in the last paragraph, you demonstrated that it's in one word, one phrase. Is really insignificant to the great the greatness of our brains and our machashava, our thought process, etc. And and it's even more so when it comes to Hashem. But this chapter is going to focus specifically on Hashem and the topic of speech. Well, I'm sure some of you know the word anthropomorphic, which means attributing human qualities to God. Um, we we use words because that's all we have to describe actions of God, 
For example, God's outstretched arm that took us out of Egypt. Um, there's no arms. God doesn't have a corporeal form. Um, but it's how it's, it's how we how the Torah and how we can relate to Hashem. When we say that Hashem sees, doesn't mean Hashem has eyes like we do. So what does it mean? So if I tell you, keep an eye on this bo this box for a minute, doesn't mean you physically take your eye and you put it on the box. Of course not. It means have an awareness. Yeah, like that. I have an awareness of that particular box. So too, when I talk about God's seeing, it's a concept of awareness. And we could go on through the whole list of things, but we're not going to be talking about everything except for, for speech. So let's take a look now at the beginning of the chapter. I'm going to read just a few lines, and I'm going to take a look at a little thing that Rev, uh, that Rev uh, Steinzahl says. Then we read a bunch of other lines, and we're going to go into a, a, a longer discussion from Rev Steinzahl because he really makes some very amazing points on this. One of the side notes, I'm going to need to end a few minutes early because I have a meeting right after our class, literally right up against it. So sorry about that. I know you'll be devastated. Um, okay. Yeah. Cry. You're crying me a river. All right. So, We cannot in any way, shape, or form compare the attribute of speech of God to the attribute of speech of human beings. Um, right here at the beginning. When a human being speaks a word, the, 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 the air that's expelled with his with his speech from his mouth, you can actually see that. Like sometimes, you know, icky, it's gross, but sometimes someone could spit. Or you can actually talk, if you talk real close to somebody, you can you could feel the breath you could feel something that's from their mouth. And it's an it moved show. It's already separate from the source. The source is the person. The, the words that came out, you can't see the words, but you can feel, in a sense, something that's, that's left the person's body. It's his breath. So it's two separate entities after the words leave the mouth. It's part of, no, it came from the intellect and the emotions and all these things we talked about before. And now it's separate from your body. The, the words I say now that you hear have left me. They're in your ears, so to speak, right? They're not part of me anymore. We cannot say that the words, and I'm using this word in quotes right now, that leave Hashem, that Hashem's speech, is separate from Hashem. Why? He, if that were the case, there'd be something outside of Hashem. <coughs> there's nothing that's outside of Hashem. And there's no space that's free from Hashem's presence. Therefore, we cannot we say that Hashem's speech is nothing like our speech. Now, in parentheses, I'm going to read this also. He tells us something in Pasuk you may know. If you pay attention to the reading of the Haftorah on a fast day, you'll recognize this Pasuk. It says in parentheses, Just like Hashem's thought process is not like ours. For it says, Hashem says, my thoughts are unlike yours. And I'm going to explain that in a minute. It also says, now, what does it mean Hashem's thoughts are not like our thoughts? So I can say like this. I might think it means like this, that I know how a scientist can show me how an elephant's brain works and how the thought process happens in an elephant and how it may be in, an, in a fish and compare it to a human being. So there's something to compare. But when, when you start, when you're comparing Hashem's thoughts and quotes to our kind of thought process, you're not quote, you're not comparing a different thought process. You're comparing our thought process to the color purple. I mean, there's no comparison. It's just something else. It's just not even the same ballpark, same universe. It's nothing. So, so far, all he has established in these few lines has been that there's a mag uh, there is a massive difference between humans' speech and Hashem's quote-unquote speech. In humans, there's the human being. Then there's the speech. It's separate. By Hashem, it's all one and the same. He hasn't shown us how yet. You have to hold on for a couple minutes for that. What I do want to do is take a look at one brief slide. 
this. This talks about the idea that when we speak, that it's separate from us. Hadibura enoshi, human speech. After it's been spoken, it's no longer connected to the source. And again, when I say these words and you hear them, those words aren't connected to me anymore, right? They're gone. They're gone from me. It's not connected to my neshama in any way, shape, or form. The speech in a general form is it's, an, uh, it's the option, the ability to communicate outwards. So no, if I sit here and I think to myself what I want to say, and I don't say the words, I have not communicated anything with you. But you can communicate without words. I'll tell you a story about that in a second, I think, if I remember. Um, but if the purpose of speech is communication, this possibility or this potential, the only way you can put this potential speech into action is to enable the words to leave you. So if I want to say to you, if I want to say to my wife, I love you, but I just think it, it doesn't do anything. But if I say the words, I love you, now they have left me. They're no longer part of me. Now, just a brief comment about this, that's, that you can communicate without speech. My first year teaching in Amit, which is almost 10 years ago now, Baruch Hashem, I was teaching, I, my, for my first days, teaching an English class, and somehow the topic of communication came up, the word communication, shoret. And someone asked me something about, is, is, is speaking and communication the same thing? I said, definitely not. Speaking is a subset of communication. They didn't understand what I'm talking about, of course. So I explained. I said, I can communicate with you with words. I can communicate with you with motion. I go like this, but meaning get out or wait, you know, anything. So don't confuse speech and communication as being the same thing. They are not. While we're thinking about words, I'm not communicating with you, but I might do something to signal from some form of communication. What he's talking about here now is speech, plain and simple speech. That in order for me to bring potential to speech and to do something about it, it has to leave me. <inaudible> words, or speech rather, is what allows me to move words from me, from my, my persona, my being, outward. <inaudible> when it goes out, <inaudible> it's no longer part of me. Right? You can't say, oh, that, oh there's that words right there floating in the air. It doesn't work that way doesn't mean your words can't come back to haunt you, that your words can't hurt somebody. That We're not talking about that at all. It just means they're no longer physically part of me. As soon as someone says something, you can't bring it back. Like, uh, I don't remember what movie it was or show, like, you know, it's, it's like you shoot a gun. It's like you can't just, like, grab the bullets back and just grab it back. You shoot, you say the words, you said the words. You can't grab them back. There's a difference between the essence of a person and his speech. There is a potential for um, uh, existence of words separate from man. It doesn't need, in other words, my words that you hear do not require my focusing on those words any longer. In other words, those words are still going to be in your brain that I say, even if I'm not thinking about them anymore. They, they they will continue to exist, right? So if you think back to a song that you heard today, 30 years ago, whatever it might be, that song, the person maybe passed away already, is no longer alive. But it doesn't require that person because those words are gone. They're separate from the individual. That's humans. Now, okay, we have to go back to the text for a minute. I'm going to pick it up over here. We only refer to the word of the, the, the speech of Hashem as speech. It's only meant as a parable. Okay. And again, what's, what, what he means is it's anthropomorphic. Hashem doesn't speak. Oh, wait a minute. God spoke to Moshe. God said to Moshe. What about all those psukim? We're going to deal with that in a few minutes. But right now he says the fact that we call Hashem or say he speaks, it's only a mashal. 
כמו שדיבור התחתון שבאדם הוא מגלה לשומעים מה שהיה צפון ונעלם במחשבתו, just like in this world our speech is something that, that reveals what was hidden inside of us, like right now if I'm thinking to myself, I really don't like that person, okay? It's, it's my matzpun, it's my, con- my, my conscience, okay? I'm not, I'm not verbalizing, but if I say the words out loud, it then reveals what I'm thinking. Or if I say, I'm hungry for pizza, then it reveals what I was thinking. Doesn't it? So too, when it comes in the heavens, so to speak, by Hashem, the light of God and the essence of life that God gives, he has the ability to um, bring, to reveal his, his speech in quotes reveals the creation of worlds and to give them life. That's what we call speech by God. What? Okay, it's a lot of words here. What does that mean? What does that mean? That just like my speech reveals what is hidden in my mind, it could be as simple as I want pizza or I want to go to sleep or whatever it might be, it reveals what was inside. So too, the same thing process, so to speak, happens by Hashem. Something that is in Hashem's machashava. Again, I'm not going to keep saying in quotes because we already know it doesn't mean for real. Is then is um, the, 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 that which was hidden becomes revealed. But by Hashem, what becomes revealed? The fact that we exist. The fact that we exist. Hashem created the world. That's going to say in a minute. We're not going to come to it now. That Hashem created the world with the Asara Ma'amarot, the 10 utterances, doesn't mean that God said, spoke and these things came into existence. It means that the things came into existence and revealed that which was hidden, so to speak, within Hashem. Now, what does this mean in normal language? And, and that concept of revelation of that which was hidden is by God called speech. So let's take a look now at Rav, uh, Rav Steinsaltz. HaTzad HaMeshutaf Eino Efo B'Mahut HaDibur Ela B'Tzido HaFunkcional The connection, the, the, the things that have in common between human speech and Hashem's Dibur, therefore, is, is not in the essence of speech, but in some some way, just something functional. What does that mean? Tafkidosha dibur, the job of speech is liot emtsai shel kamunukatsia shel ha'acher. What is the purpose of speech? Now, I know that I'm sure, like me, many of you talk to yourselves. When you're talking to yourself, you're not communicating with anybody other than yourself, because communicating isn't necessarily by yourself. So the purpose of speech is to communicate. Good morning. How are you? We're on page 903. How much does that cost? I'm communicating with somebody. So it's a it's an emsa'ut. It's an emsa'i. It's a, a uh, uh, I don't know how you say it in English anymore. It's that which allows us to communicate with somebody else. In order to, to uh, enable there to be a connection between one person and another. And in a more broad description, this is what he said in the text already, that in a, in a more encompassing way, we can look at speech, one, not as encompassing, it's, it's a communication tool. More encompass, more broad description is, it's taking what was in potential my mind, bringing it out from the hidden to the revealed. Speech is moving thing, something, information from one level to another. Something that goes from one level that is less understood, less acquirable to a higher level. Me, again, I think about I like pizza doesn't make a difference in your world whatsoever. It's not something you could see, taste, touch, what my, what's going on in my head right now. As soon as I say the words, I have elevated that and I've revealed it to an available something that you can see, so to speak. From the level, uh, it also means it goes from a level of un, 
revealed, to something you can't connect to, you can't relate to my thoughts, to to a level where now they are revealed and you can relate to it. I say to you, I want go. For, I'm hungry for pizza, and you say to me, you know what? Me too. Let's go get some pizza. So I've taken something. I've used it for communication. I've also raised it from a thought process to speech, from hidden to revealed. The muvan zen this mean in this meaning or understanding. We can also talk about the power of God who can create universes. It comes from the hidden, from the hidden of the, in, the uh, infinite, meaning God. To what? What does it become? Creation or create a created item. That is like the speech of God. This is going to come as a very big surprise to most people. By the way, when I learned this a number of years back, I was, the word's not shocked, it's like, like I was dumbfounded. He said, this is the, this is uh, the thesis of the, Admar um, Zaken, the, the author Tanya, and many, many, many. Uh, I don't know if it's true for everybody because I can't say. His thesis says as follows. It is prohibited to imagine that God actually speaks in the manner that we understand. Again, what about this whole business of God said to Moshe and all? He says, Lo kol, not even that God would speak with a voice, Lo ba'otiot, nor that he uses words or letters, uh, and no, no, any kind of a mechanism with which speech would happen. Ah, so what happens? But, the compare the connection of the, the thing they have in common is not that we have in common with God the, the basic function of speech, meaning that God uses it for communication. When we speak about when we speak about the, the the godly speech and kavanato lomar it does not mean to say that it's similar to human speech in its nuances and in all its um, detail. How is it similar to human speech? Number one, it's a form of communication. That God can connects to the hidden in God idea with the outside world. Again, he's going to come to this in a minute about the Bayomer Vayedaber at all. Also, when he comes to the, the language itself, this Shoresh, Dalet Betresh, has at least a double meaning. Dabar Dalet Betresh Muvano Manhig. It has a meaning of leader. Kamo Dabar Echalado. The Gemara Sanhedrin says that every generation has at least one main leader. Uchmo Uruk Sav Kvasim Kidabram. Ummuvan, that's on one hand, the word Dalet Betresh means leader. Ummuvan Ze Midbar, we talk about a Midbar, which we translate as desert. Why is the desert called a desert? It's also called that, called that because there, very often in the desert, all you have to do is look out some of our back windows, you will see people leading sheep. It's a place where things are led, i.e. in this case, sheep. Therefore, Dalet Bet Reish indicates transfer, movement. Continue, continuity from one place to another. In Hebrew, there is another Shoresh in Hebrew that has also a dual meaning. And the word Nun Gimel Dalad also has a meaning of uh, leader. Uh, hold on, I have it in my book. It's one more sentence, so forget that. It also has the idea of Speaking, telling, sipur davarim, shalgilui davar, also revelation. 
Kemo Hagida Nali Efo Efo Himroin, which is in the Parashat Shavua, where it says that tell me where they are grazing. So what's his point here? What's he trying to tell us so far? And then I'll come to the by Debera Shem El Moshe in a second. He's trying to, first of all, disabuse us of the thought that God speaks. That's first. Second of all, we have a power of speech different from God. Our power of speech is separate from us. God's speech is not speech. It's a communication tool like it is for us. It also is something that brings out something that was hidden and makes it visual. What is it that was hidden and becomes visible? Everything. Everything that exists is a manifestation of Hashem's quote-unquote thoughts. It's his dibur. His speech is bringing something into existence. But it's not separate from Hashem. It's part of Hashem. It doesn't change Hashem. But we're going to see that. I'm going to read you something that's not on your screen. It's just a, a sentence that has to do with this issue of by the Be'er Hashem, etc. The question that is a good question to ask, says Rav Steinzalz, about all the anthropomorphic statements in Tanakh. Why use them in the first place? What is the purpose of the expression, Vayomer Hashem, and God spoke? But we know it is nothing like our speech. Why use the expression? It almost sounds like it can make us make mistakes. In other places of Rav Steinzelt, there is a very long discussion about this topic. And the conclusion is, we have no choice. The problem that humans have with anything connected to God, we lack the vocabulary. Our words cannot in any way really describe something that is abstract. I'll give you a normal example. I mean, nothing to do, I shouldn't say it's not with God because everything has to do, but not the topic of God. Explain to somebody who doesn't know what love is, what is love? Don't start singing what's love got to do with this, okay? Just explain what's love. What does it mean to have a feeling about something? It's an abstract concept. We don't have the words for it. When there is new technology, when new technology comes out, one of the things that the, the industries will struggle with is naming them. What do we call these things, right? So there was not ever a calculator until, let's say, the, in the eight, until the, I mean, a, a little pocket calculator, until the 80s, right? Still remember the first calculator my dad, Olivishalm, bought cost a hundred dollars and all it did was add subtract multiply and divide that's all it did now you can get them give them away like with candy so they had to come up with a word to indicate calculator one of the things that the academia does the, the academy for uh, here in Yerushalayim for i think it's Yerushalayim, uh the hebrew language is coming up with words for things that don't have words yet um, and also clarification. It's a magnificent website, and they have all kinds of wonderful videos if you're into the language. But what we're saying, he's saying here, is like we don't have the words. It's impossible for us to say, "Oh, and God revealed from from the hidden to the just say." So the Torah says, "Vayom Hashem, Vaydaber Hashem, Vayar Hashem Kitov," because those are the words we need because we lack a dictionary, uh, a a a, 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 voc a vocabulary to speak about what Hashem does. Now. Just as a recap, all we've done tonight is say that the speech between man and God is very different because you can't even compare them. They do have something, two things in common. They take from the hidden to be revealed, and it's a form of communication. Hashem's form of speech is the revelation. Something comes into existence into being. Again, I've mentioned to you many, many times. One, This is classic. We've seen so far in Tanya. He gives us little bits about building blocks. He's building to something. Okay, so this chapter, which we're not finishing now, we'll finish possibly next week, will give us the building block of God's speech. Yeah, okay. So Bezrat Hashem, next Tuesday night, um, during Hanukkah, uh, we will have class, Bezrat Hashem. And uh, that's it. 
I wish everyone a good night. I told you I have to stop a couple minutes early. And uh, she some Have a good evening, everybody.